Hello, folks. How you doing today? Welcome to the show. My name is Roy Bensvi, and this is the Genuinely Interested Podcast. I'm happy that you are tuning in and listening because we got a great episode this week. We have Damian Mander on the show, who I've wanted to interview for a long time. I've watched his, I watched his TED Talk probably around seven years ago or so, and I left it very inspired. I think that was when I initially started to change my my way of thinking about about animals about the way we eat and Damien and a few others were definitely the catalyst for me to to, to change my daily habit of, of eating meat and what I saw the the connection between what we eat environmentalism climate change how it's all connected so he was definitely one of the one of the guys that planted the seed in my head Damien is a uh, an Iraq war veteran. He served in the Navy as well, and eventually he found his way to Africa, where he started the International Anti Poaching Foundation. And what they do is essentially they try to work within the limitations of the law to stop poachers from killing animals, mainly elephants and mainly rhinos. These animals are on the verge of extinction because of poaching human encroachment, trophy hunting, and other factors as well are bringing these uh, poor animals basically to extinction. Uh, so someone like Damien comes along and sells all his properties, essentially goes all in on this foundation and really brings a new way of thinking to conservation. A few years ago, he founded Akashinga, which is um, all women ranger program. And they've seen amazing results with, with what they, they've done there. And we actually talk about that on the podcast. So if you want to know a little bit more, listen to, to the podcast. And, and he gives some amazing stats, some amazing figures. And, you know, it wasn't easy. He, did, he says that there was some resistance from the community, from the chiefs initially. But after they've brought back proven results, there's little little anyone can say to, to refute what they've done. And I think that they'll be able to export this program to other places and, and hopefully start to be very, very successful with this uh, worldwide, and especially in places like Africa where they really need it. If you want to know more about Akashinga, uh, look it up. I think that he said they're releasing around November. And this is a um, documentary that they worked with James Cameron who's an amazing director and environmentalist. Uh, I know he's put a lot of money into different organizations across the world that, that work with animals, that work with the environment. So it's good to have someone like that with the funds, with the capital, with the backing, with the influence that cares about these type of projects. And again, Damien is one of those people that there's no middle. It's zero to 100. So essentially when he decides... He's doing something. He's doing that thing. He goes all in. And you have to salute these type of people. They're not common. There's people that go there, go about their whole lives not knowing exactly what they want to do. And they have one foot here and one foot there. And I think I'm one of those people. I like to have my toes dipping in four different uh, barrels of water. And it's hard for me to, to commit to one thing and go all in on that one thing, unless it's poker, then I definitely go all in. But other than that, <laughs> it's a difficult choice for me to make. And I do salute people like Damien and a couple of other people that I've had on the podcast. And I always love that single-minded approach that, hey, there is a problem here. I'm going to go all in. And there's just nothing that can stop me. And I think people like this are crucial for the betterment of society. People who just are not going to take no for an answer and people that see the, the big picture know that, okay, I'm not going to see a change tomorrow, but I'm going to see a change in 10 or 20 or 30 years. And if I'm not going to do something about it, I'm not, nothing's going to happen. And I just don't, I'm not going to wait till someone else says, hey, you know what? I'm, let, me, let me take care of this. Um, yeah, they just don't wait around for the next person to solve the problem, they take initiative and matters into their own hands. 
And personally, again, that's just a trait that I uh, admire, look up to, and I'm grateful that people like this exist and they are doing what they're doing. Now, as far as the podcast, really appreciate I'm seeing more subscribers, more downloads. And if you guys have any comments, requests, emails in the show notes, hit me up, let me know. Um, Yeah, I really appreciate the support and uh, growing support. As far as any of uh, Damien's links, I'll put in the show notes as well. And you can, you know, research him and you can look him up and you can follow him and get up to date um, notifications about what's happening with IAPF. Uh, the documentary. And yeah, I think in in this time, it's important uh, within our limitations, obviously, uh, everyone's got some economic hardships going on. But if we can, we should definitely support these type of organizations because they're doing amazing work under the hardest circumstances and with limited funds. So if you can, definitely support them. It's enough of my rambling for this intro. So without further ado, Here is this week's guest, Damien Mander. The Genuinely Interested Podcast. Hey, Damien, how you doing? Good day, mate. How's things? Good, good. I I love the good day, mate. I can hear that all day. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, the Aussie accent... uh, Gets me out a lot out of a lot of trouble when I'm uh, in the states uh, touring, uh, doing speaking gigs. So I can generally get away with a lot more. Oh yeah, Americans love that shit. A, a yeah. Australian accent and British accent, you can pretty much get away with murder in the U.S. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, yeah pretty much. It's like a get out of jail free. Yeah, I, uh, I have a I have a British friend, and 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 we would go out to to bars and restaurants and he would just you know with his posh english accent he would just ask the waiter is it okay if uh, we get this extra thing or can you give us a discount you're like sure sure, sure. i'm like dude i could never get away with that with, with american <laughs> accent it's just impossible it, it works the other way too uh, i used to be in the navy and when the american uh, warships used to pull up uh in australia we we didn't even bother going out that weekend because uh there's all these american accents around town and uh <laughs> yeah, we we, just, we we stayed at home. <laughs> I think you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll have to try that one week. Well, not maybe not now since I'm married, but yeah, yeah. Who knows? In, in another life. Um, <laughs> yeah, so so you're originally from Australia, right? Yeah, man. Uh, born and raised, born in Melbourne, and then sort of raised uh, between Sydney and Melbourne, between those two cities. Uh, so I always by the ocean, loved it, lived it. And uh, now, yeah, what, what are we? Forty years of age, and I, I live in a landlocked country, so I do miss the ocean a little bit. Uh, miss the family, miss the friends sometimes, but uh, Zimbabwe is home now. So, how do you allocate uh, your time as far as being in Australia and then being in uh, Zimbabwe? So, I went back to Australia. It was the first time in two years over over Christmas, over December last year, and uh, spent a month back there. Just catching up, and that was the longest time I've ever been away from home since I left. Uh, I left home in two thousand and five when I deployed to Iraq, and yeah, I haven't haven't lived back in Australia since. Wow. Uh, um, yeah, so maybe kind of touch up on on your childhood a little bit. I read that originally, you know, used to go um, get fish, sell the fish, um, and that's kind of what led you, I guess, in high level to the. Uh, the path you were as a navy diver well yeah so we're well, not fish but uh so i used to i used to well, i started down the down a local fishing pier the, the jetty one day and i saw um uh this guy pulled up a, a fishing lure and sold it back to a fisherman uh, and this guy had all the scuba diving equipment and he got five bucks for it i thought shit that's that's pretty cool I was 13 or 14 at the time, so I went and got myself a, a mask and snorkel and started diving down. I'd get a, get a few jigs and come gasping to the air, uh, to the surface for air, and I'd you know I'd sell those back and, and five or ten bucks as a 13 year old is not bad money. And then yeah. I, you know I went and bought myself a set of fins and then got a, a th- really thin wetsuit actually that's all I could afford. Uh, uh, and I started being able to stay in the water longer, got better at free diving, diving down deeper, uh, collecting more of these these squid fishing lures, what they used to catch the calamari uh, overnight. And 
and then just sort of fell in love with diving. I used the, the money that I was getting from selling these jigs to start getting scuba diving equipment and, and just, yeah, so I started diving from a young age and I spent more time in the water than out of it, I think. And then uh, uh, for any kid that's grown up diving and, and loves diving and, and sees it as a, as a potential career, I suppose the ultimate uh, level of diving is, is being a diver in the Navy and that's what I set out to do. Yeah, so and then you know you enlisted in the army and and you went and you try to be a diver, but they they didn't they kind of rejected you. They told you we're not interested, and they put you in a different position, right? Well, initially I tried to join when I was seventeen and nine months, which is the youngest you can join, and they weren't taking uh, divers essentially as direct entry into the military at that stage. You had to transfer from something else once you're already in there. Uh, and then th- I just finished high school, and things started sort of drifting off path for me uh i was working as i was actually i mean i was a garbage collector hey working on, on the back of a garbage truck and that sucked and yeah i actually got involved like fell in with the, you know some of the wrong people well uh, people i'd grown up with our mates and then next thing i was selling drugs and doing drugs and uh and a bunch of my mates got arrested and ended up in prison and uh i um i heard a, i heard an ad on the radio uh, a few months earlier and just uh, it was advertising for people to come and join the Navy as an electronics technician. So I thought, shit, yeah, that's that's my ticket out of here. And uh, ended up joining the Navy at the same time a bunch of mates were going to prison. And, um, yeah, I suppose, uh, I suppose, you know, just got a, a very lucky opportunity there and, and made the most of it. So how do you go from being a diver in one of the most elite units uh, to a sniper, essentially? Yeah, it's quite so, uh, quick. Yeah, so I, I mean, I joined up, got started on my electronics trade, and then uh, transferred category as quickly as possible to go and do uh, the CDAT, the clearance diver acceptance test, and that's it. That's our version of Buds or Hell Week. Uh, okay. Twelve days of basically being put through all the pillars of misery to be hungry, cold, tired, and wet, and uh, you learn a lot about yourself. You sort of, I suppose strip bare to your soul in, in a way to see who you are as a person and at the end, end, end of that when uh there's only a few people left around you uh and the rest have gone you realize there's nothing special about you other than that uh, when everybody said it was too hard it couldn't be done uh you're one of the few to say no fuck this man this is this is me this is where i belong and um so yeah, I went on and served as a as a Navy clearance diver. That's, uh, that's the closest Australia has to Navy SEALs. And then uh, post September 11, uh, which changed the world for a lot of people, uh, myself included, um, the Australian government set up what they termed a first and last resort for a terrorist attack on home soil, uh, and that was to be uh, called Tactical Assault Group East. Uh, and I'd come across there, uh, made it through all the selections. And uh, I went went to Water Troop actually being a diver. They needed um, – it was made up of land, water, and sniper platoons, very small platoons, uh, very small niche uh, capability, special operations unit. Um, and I, I'd come across there, went straight into Water Platoon and been there only two days to, and told I was going to do a job that you can't ask to do in our military. You're told you're doing it, and that, that was to become a special operations sniper. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I, I was in the army as well, and we have a similar thing to to Hell Week. I was in the Israeli army, and I can definitely, I can definitely relate. It do, it definitely sucks. It's uh, it's, it's not a fun week. Remind me no. to tell you a good story about uh, a friend of a friend from the Israeli army later on in this interview. <laughs> okay, you'll get a good laugh out of it. All right, I can't wait. Um, cool, man. Yeah, so essentially. And you, I, I love your honesty in, in a lot of the interviews that I heard. And you essentially said, yeah, I, I joined the Army because I saw it as a way to travel, have adventure, and essentially make money so I can invest back in real estate. And, and not for some ideological reason, which I think is is what you hear most people usually go in the Army for. Yeah. Um, you know, it's we're all a product of our past, I suppose, and just... Uh... You know, I wouldn't change anything along along the way. It's been um, been one hell of a trip. Uh, hasn't always yeah. been easy, but being able to look back now on on the path I've walked and and the skills and experiences I've got along the way, and I wouldn't I wouldn't change anything. Even even who I was as a person uh, before joining the military, uh, I've come 180 degrees uh, you know, before 
uh, the military. I was a hunter and you know, trying to evoke some form of primal respect from my peers by taking aim at the vulnerable. And then, uh, and then you go through the military. Iraq has a way of breaking down the, the layers of ego uh, you build around yourself and, and uh, just the way you view the world. And you know, when you're part of a machine that's just obliterated a, a country and a culture, uh, yeah, it really makes you reflect on, on you know, what, 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 what can I take away from the lessons uh, of what I've just been a part of and how can I turn that into something positive going forward? Yeah, you know, I, I was in the army for about two, uh, almost two and a half years. And, and from what I saw, you were, I think it was close to 10 years, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I did ten, uh, just under 10 years in the military. Uh, um, about three of that was a, as a private contractor in Iraq, uh, working um, working in various uh, roles over there. Yeah, because for me, after two and a half hours, ready to go, man, I was I couldn't stand it anymore. I was just I wanted to leave. I wanted to start my quote unquote real life and and travel and everything. And so, I mean, what what made you? I, I guess what a made you stay that long, and b what made you eventually leave? Well, and now I know all the army guys listening to this are going to get a little bit cranky, and, and the air force guys even more crankier. But I started my military career in the navy, so. When the air force is like a hundred miles out the back from any action, they're they you know sitting on an airstrip waiting to do some work, and the army guys are between the navy guys and the air force guys lying in some dirt somewhere. The navy boys we're skipping along the wharf, uh, along the ocean's edge, and having a good time. So waiting waiting for our ship to sail off to the next port. So the navy days were awesome. Army, I, I never served in a regular army, so I mean I actually never worn an army uniform. Uh, it was. It was oh straight into special operations um, and uh, and then Iraq you know Iraq was Iraq was game time so you sort of been doing all the training it's time to go and um, play the game on the weekend you know uh, so yeah look I, there was never any any dull moments it was I mean I'm doing shit in real life that that kids can't master on a PlayStation and uh, you know jumping out of choppers blowing shit up uh, Hanging with my sniper rifle, uh, you know, so it, it was, it was quite surreal, and it never really seemed like a job. That's um, that's that's. I think that should be your soundbite. I've because I've, I've heard it a few times. That I'm doing shit in real life that kids can do in PlayStation. I think that's yeah. such a great analysis because uh, you know it, it is for the most most people when they think of either police or, or military what they see is what they see in movies right but there's yeah. a there's a select few of people that actually do it and i think and even out of those half of them are they're doing office jobs they're doing menial work it's it's not super exciting but then the yeah. other half is really doing the the hollywood shit that yeah you know, yeah so it's it's uh and then so i mean i went from from the military and and sf into more of a law enforcement role uh, in uh, in Iraq. We were training the Iraqi Special Police and the Iraqi National Police, which was set up to replace a, a disbanded, uh, would have been disbanded by uh, the, the coalition when they got there. So essentially put a million people out of work overnight. We were trying to replace that and just recruiting battalion-sized groups, mixture of Sunni and Shiite from around the country, form them up, give them training as quickly as possible and send them out. And everywhere we sent them, we caused... Uh, more conflict, and uh, you know, the, the reason there was conflict is the people, the areas that these people were being sent to, they weren't from that area, and they had no vested interest in that area, uh, and they they're all geared up. They've got this uniform now, and this sense of authority, and this sense of power, and they wanted to project it. And uh, you know, I got a lot of mates that still work in law enforcement, uh, and watching what's going on in the news at the moment, it's it's really unfortunate to see that such an important industry can be poisoned by uh, you know a few bad eggs uh, that are going out there and using that uniform as a way to demonstrate power and authority over people, uh, over the very people that they they signed on to protect in the first place. And whenever you pull on any sort of uniform, you walk a very fine line between um, what's moral and what is not. And that I suppose that's the the weaving the, the golden thread of law enforcement and being 
able to know when you escalate something and when you de-escalate something. The first priority in anything to do should always be to de-escalate yeah. and uh, use the minimum amount of force. So it's 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 really sad to see um, just the way things have unfolded. Uh, and I know there's many layers to this in, in the U.S. context, uh, and law enforcement yeah. is, is only one of them. Uh, but it's it's been you know quite disturbing to see the levels of power and authority that that people assume. Uh, when they when they pull on a uniform, and, and for some, it's a, they transcend into monsters. And uh, you know, uh, wearing wearing any type of uniform, uh, the, the duty is 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 to uphold your values, not just to have them pinned up in the locker room, but the, the, you know that y- your job is to uphold not only the values of your unit, but the values of society, uh, and, and to protect, not to exploit. Yeah, yeah, and, and you're seeing that a little bit here in the U.S. I mean, it's that famous. Um experiment right right where they uh they split the the two camps and they made one group body um like they were the uh, exactly yeah yeah that yeah. one that famous Professor one so Zimbardo, it, yeah it's uh it's human it's i don't know i don't want to say human nature because it sounds bad but it's there's yeah. something within our dna that we like to be the superior group and we you know we feel like anything that our group is always the best one and that's why we're part of that group and the other yeah. ones are just not as good for whatever reason it's uh it's a, it's a fucked up dna that unfortunately we humans have and hopefully we'll uh will yeah. evolve on that not, with time it's not all of us uh no not all of know, us but it's 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 some of us and, and as i said it's often a very fine line uh under pressure I'll say one thing, and maybe we'll get on it to it later in, in, in the interview, but uh, we, we run a program here called Akashinga, which is the world's first all-female uh, all armed anti-poaching units and the only network of nature reserves in the world to be uh, protected by women. And um, I'll say that they have completely shifted my perception of law enforcement uh, uh, and how to go about doing this role uh, but building relationships at the same time, and uh, the women, um, we we started this as as a, as a as a trial of desperation because we're having these we're essentially having these ongoing sustained wars with local communities that surrounded the areas we're trying to protect, vast areas with animals that have valuable body parts like elephant for their ivory or rhinos for their, for their horn. Uh, killed so that these products can be sold into organized crime networks and, and sent to Southeast Asia. And we, we had helicopters, we had guys with resumes like mine, we had bigger fences and more guns on a, on a continent that's going to have 2 billion people by 2040. And we were looking for a different way to try and do things because having this ongoing war with these communities was, was expensive and it wasn't sustainable. It was the same thing we're doing in, in Iraq. We're bringing in people from around the country to then form up as a group and go out and protect an area from the local population. And it, 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 there's no example in history of that working out well uh, on a long-term basis. And uh, when we started Akashinga, it was, it was essentially out of desperation at a time when uh, we, were, we were desperately trying to find a different way to do things, a different model. Um, and now me having come from all male units uh, my entire military career uh, and having built a, a career across three continents in training men uh, for the front lines, I'd never worked with women. And so when we started this, we, we actually um, we didn't know what to expect. And, and uh, three years later, uh, the women have made 194 arrests. They've helped drive an 80% downturn in elephant poaching across one of the largest uh, elephant populations left on the planet. Uh, they have completely de-escalated local tension with the local communities that they came from. We haven't had a single incidence of corruption. Uh, we cut our core operating budget by two-thirds because the women are having conversations instead of conflict. Uh, we don't have helicopters and uh, military-grade hardware. We, we're having interpersonal relationships driven by the women uh, with the communities that they grew up with uh, and in, uh, the communities that they'll raise their own families in. Uh, and I think in a way... A small group of women in, in rural Africa achieved what few armies or, or police departments in history have ever been able to do, and that is to win the hearts and minds of the local population. And uh, we've got a, a whole different way now of, of looking at, at how we not only do conservation, but if if, if we can come in here in, in a landlocked country uh, and and uh, get a case study going like this, uh, which has such an amazing 
effect in the conservation uh, theatre than what's possible beyond this country or what's cost, uh, possible beyond the conservation industry. I mean, was it difficult initially to convince uh, the community that female rangers is, is the path forward? Or was this a, a trial thing that you were like, all right, let's see if this works? Or were you confident? So you, you weren't super confident that it would work initially. No, it was it was very difficult to get that buy-in initially from the chiefs and traditional leaders uh, in, a, in a very patriarchal society where any job that's being given should go to a man, and then uh, any a, a woman's role is is in the fields, in the kitchen, looking after the family. Uh, as much as I hate to say that, that's the perception uh, in the communities that we tried to get this uh, program initiated in. And it took like quite some negotiation to get the initial three-day period where they would allow us to do a selection phase. And I, I know that in that selection phase, they expected the program to fall on its face and us to turn around and say, all right, yeah, this, is, this, this was a bad idea. In actual fact, um, it turned out to be the best thing we've ever done. Is this something you think you can export to other communities across Africa? Like this model of, that you have right now, is that something you can export beginning with Africa and then potentially maybe even to other communities across the world? We started in one reserve uh, in the Lower Zambezi uh, of Zimbabwe. We've now got seven reserves that are under contract. Uh, we haven't started working in all of them yet, but that's the expansion we've had. And the expansion has been driven through requests we've had from other communities and other traditional leaders. Um, uh, we've also, uh, in partnership with uh, Segera, uh Reserve in Kenya, uh, and a friend of mine, Jochen Zeitz, a former CEO of Puma, uh, have replicated the model there in, uh, in, in Kenya, and we hope that it, uh, he's in the process of setting up a training facility where he'll be able to train more women from around the region. And we're in the process now of discussing um, uh, long-term leases of three large blocks totaling about one million acres uh, in Botswana, where we'll also uh, replicate the model. So it's 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 definitely expanding. Uh, there's a lot of people looking at um, at what we're doing, and, uh, and you know trying to trying to learn from from this as a case study. Um, I did a I did a talk at, in Chicago um, at the Botanical Gardens there. Uh, last year, and at the end of it, there was, a, there was a guy there was an advisor to the Chicago Police Department uh, with a, his own history in law enforcement. And he's like, you know, we 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 looking at different ways of doing things. You know, kicking people's doors in and putting guns in their faces isn't isn't the answer. And uh, the the women, the way they go about their business, it's it's like a a weapon is a is a is a tool to do a job. It's not a toy to wave around at at, at every opportunity. Uh, and and with myself, with a background in counterinsurgency warfare, our job is generally to look for a fight and finish it. And, and women are more inclined to want to talk to a problem before they blow it up. Yeah, that is that's very true. Um, so I guess you finish. Let's go. I mean, if we could go back a little bit, you finish the army. Um, you know, you have your little. Uh, fun, I guess, maybe after the army for a while, and then for you know you decide to go to to Africa, um, where you eventually start the um, the anti poaching foundation. Yeah. What was you know maybe take us through the steps? What was the catalyst for you to you know set this whole thing in motion? And yeah, just walk us through it. So I mean, after three years in Iraq, uh, I mean, not continuous, I had leave periods and that, but uh, South America is where I ended up as. Uh, I thought it was a holiday and a, and a, a reward, uh, having just finished my military career and done fairly well uh, financially through residential property investment. Uh, didn't need to work for the foreseeable future and, and turn that into a bunch of excuses. You'd go out and spend a year doing drugs and alcohol. And uh, I know this seems to be like a 10-year pattern emerging here. And I'm just <laughs> 10, it's 11 years since South America now. But, um, <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, you know, for a lot of guys, and you can probably relate to this, uh, the camaraderie. I did the, same, I did the same trip. Yeah, I did the same trip. Yeah, yeah. well, we, it's it's when the military finishes and the the friend, the, the circle of friends around you is gone, and so is the purpose. Uh, sometimes the easiest thing is um, is alcohol and drugs, unfortunately. And and in America, we got 
think around 22 US veterans a day committing suicide, guys that, that couldn't figure out how to reintegrate back into society. Uh, I mean, you're trained to shoot someone from a mile away and you want to come back and drive an Uber, Uber or flip burgers. It doesn't work. And, uh, and people don't understand it. And, and so, um, I mean, fortunately for me, when I hit rock bottom, I bounced and, and used it as, as motivation to get up and, and start hitting the next chapter. And that, that turned out to be Africa, um, just based on bar room chat uh, years earlier. And um, I had it left, man. I didn't even I didn't even have a check-in bag when I went to the airport. Uh, had, a, had a small carry-on backpack and uh, uh, a one-way ticket. Yeah, and then just traveling around, seeing rangers, seeing what they're doing, seeing the animals that were being killed and all this sort of stuff is – you know, things don't just change overnight. There's the accumulation of a lot of things and a lot of thoughts. Uh, uh, having just come from uh, working within a, a $600 billion a year annual defense budget uh, as part of the coalition in Iraq, uh, and, and we, we're trying to protect oil in the ground and we had anything anything we needed, and then uh, we come over here and, and rangers are protecting the heart and lungs of the planet. And they got, they're, they're just lacking so much. You know, range is just lacking a set of boots or uniform or, or just the time of day for someone to go out and teach them how to do their job differently or better. And uh, yeah, that, that, that resonated with me because I, I, I was in, um, in uh, Africa not for the right reasons. I was there for personal selfish reasons, and that was to have an adventure. Uh, and then you know, I suppose the Rangers made me want to become a better person. Uh, you know, I was getting paid huge sums of money in Iraq, and these rangers are getting paid a couple hundred bucks a month if they're lucky. Yeah. Yes. And uh, yeah, just just you know, you've got to grab these these little bits in life as you go through these these little uh, messages and just use them, eh? Uh, use them to shape you, shape yourself. And that's what these rangers were for me. Uh, and looking at nature that's being exploited, these animals that were just trying to go about their business, uh, the fact that I used to be a hunter. Um, I never hunted after Iraq, having known what it was like to be hunted as a, as a person. Um, but you're just seeing animals that, that don't want anything else in life other than to just to live out their day and do their, do their thing of being animals, being targeted in, in such unfair and cruel ways. Uh, so, yeah, it was... Um, the catalyst of all those things coming together and, and uh, turned into liquidation of a property portfolio and setting up uh, the International Anti Poaching Foundation in 2009. So, you essentially went all in. You sold all your properties that you bought over the years and decided, I'm going all in on this, um, on this nonprofit. I, well, the way I, of life. I, yeah, I sort of have a bad habit of not doing things in halves. So when I make up my mind, <laughs> whether it's the right decision or the wrong decision, I'm, I'm all in. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a terrible poker player as well. So don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. We should play sometime. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you're dying to play against me. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so I mean, so now you're in, you know, you're in, the, the headquarters is in uh, Zimbabwe, right? Yeah, correct. Uh, in Harare, the capital, um, we've got uh, programs in Kenya uh, facilitating East Africa, here in Zimbabwe facil- facilitating Southern Africa, and then offices in, um, when I say offices, people who work from home. Uh, yeah. Not like we've got these huge big office block buildings, but uh, offices in the US, Australia, and, and South Africa. Uh, and just an amazing team of uh administrative and support staff uh, around the world that that are, are really the the solid part of the foundation uh, that sits below the tip of the spear and, and keeps uh, our rangers out there on the front lines doing their job. And and essentially, how much authority do you guys have in the area? I mean, can you shoot and arrest poachers or other trespassers? Or you you work closely with the government, or you can can you only detain them? I mean, what are the what are the rules and what are the laws? So, I mean, it varies from country to country. Uh, we have day one, lesson one is uh, is law, uh, followed by human rights, followed by ethics, uh, followed by escalation and the use of force. Uh, and so our rangers are trained, they're trained well, they're trained to deal with the shittiest of situations, but they're trained to use the minimum amount of force required to get the job done. 
doesn't mean that lethal force cannot be used uh, uh, as a first resort uh, if someone's life is in immediate danger. Um, but it, it should always be the last resort. Um, uh, and out of the, the 190 odd arrests that the women have made uh, uh, to date, there's only been shots fired once. But the uh, the mandate that that we carry is to be able to go out armed and protect the areas that we're we're sanctioned by the Zimbabwean government to protect. Uh, now, if we're follow if we're pursuing someone that we've been tracking, like in a hot pursuit, and they leave and go into into the communities, uh, we can follow them. Uh, then, uh, so it's a group of poachers, and they're on the run. We can we can we can follow them straight up, then and follow them all the way to the, the door of their house. Uh, now, if we're acting on intelligence. That we know, okay, there's a weapon here, or there's a cache of ivory that's that's buried in this this field. Uh, we go and get the police. We work very closely with the police, uh, um, a, a specialist department here called the Minerals Flora and Fauna Unit, uh, a task force set up under the Criminal Investigation Department of the Zimbabwe Republic Police. Um, the president's daughter here is actually uh, a voluntary ranger with us, uh, so yeah, we we've got very good buy-in um, with. Uh, with the government here, uh, it's, it took a long time to be able to build that trust. Um, uh, but yeah, we're always, you know, it, it does seem like a, a glamorous and, and, and often risky job, and it is. But it, it, it it's always within the confines of the law, and and always uh, in a way that we have to be able to put our heads on our pillow at, at night, close our eyes, and say we, we've we've done our job, we've done it the right way. Yeah, I, I was talking to uh, Jill Robinson, who's the founder of Animals Asia, a few weeks back, and, and she was essentially saying the same thing. Like it, it took her, I think she started, I think, uh, something like 30 years ago, and it was a long process of working with the government and changing hearts and minds. And now they're close to actually closing down all the bear bile farms in, in, in Vietnam and in China in the next yeah, that's- 10 to 15 years or so so it, it's just it's progress it just takes so long but it's you know it's yeah. awesome when you finally see the results yeah and uh jill jill uh she, her and her team do an amazing job they've got a huge amount of admiration they do and and, and also what is a completely different um uh political climate uh to have to navigate and set of regulations and laws and and i think that's that's why the smaller gra- grassroots um organizations the ones that 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 uh, getting the job done at ground level are so important. Uh, we have a lot of big, larger NGOs uh, that, that are doing lots of stuff everywhere, but the, the grassroots ones that, that, that are down there, they really understand the climate uh, at ground level and, and, and often how to get things done in the most effective way. So once... Once you guys get, get a poacher um, and, and you, you, know, you capture him, he's alive, um, is there a deterrence as far as the government? Like, what is the punishment for for poaching? Uh, so it depends on the crime. Obviously, there's a schedule uh, of fines pertaining to each different species, uh, and then you've got specially protected species. So in Zimbabwe, that would be elephant. Uh, sorry, um, not elephant. Um, uh, rhino, pangolin, uh, even a python. Um, there's automatic uh, prison sentence if you've got ivory. Uh, rhino horn uh, or pangolin, which is nine years, um, and it's not uncommon for us to do an arrest on a Monday, and, and by Wednesday afternoon, that nine year sentence has, has been handed out. And uh, uh, we're currently in in the in the middle of a huge upturn in in poaching that's going on. Uh, people are trying to take advantage uh, of a downturn in conservation funding and a downturn in tourism, uh, and tourism funds a lot of. A lot of conservation efforts here uh, in Africa, uh, and just in the last COVID, fourteen days alone, right? yeah, COVID. Uh, and in the last fourteen days alone, we've we've done eight successful uh, ivory busts. What, what, in your opinion, is the biggest threat um, to wildlife? Would you say it's poachers, trophy hunters, um, human encroachment? Maybe you know cattle that that, that graze pastures for meat. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I would say it's, it's uh, you know the the relentless march forward of of uh, the human race uh, at all costs. Um, sorry, two seconds. Uh, the relentless march forward uh, at 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 all costs to to eat, consume, 
build on top of uh, as much of nature as possible. And uh, yeah, it's it's I um, mean human encroachment and losing losing land, uh, losing uh, ecosystems that make up this rich tapestry of, of biodiversity upon which our our future as a civilization is dependent on. Uh, consuming that and destroying that, uh, uh, replacing it with cattle. Uh, poaching, of course, is a huge one. I mean, the meat industry as well is, I think, with the greatest negative environmental impact we have on this planet. Uh, so, yeah, it's um, it, it's it's us thinking that we're the we're the main act, and we're not. We're just as, as a as a global community, as a civilization, being brought to our knees by a little anteater, a pangolin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's nature just saying, hey, <laughs> you guys have got nothing. And uh, you know, this planet's been spinning for over 5 billion years and survived a lot worse than us and, and will continue to do so. And I, I know that and I suppose in, in my work I just want to be able to look back and say we help stop as much suffering as possible along the way and help hold on to as much of the natural world as we could. Yeah. So, I mean, like you mentioned before, you're uh... – a black and white zero to a hundred, like there's no middle ground for you. Um, as far as becoming vegan, did you have like just a aha moment where you were like, bam, stopped overnight or was this like a gradual process for you? I still go back and read some of the older emails we, I've got uh, from, we used to do a fundraising music festival back in Australia and we had a committee, voluntary uh, committee uh, that would help put that together. And then uh, there was a few, um, few vegans on there and they'd be saying you know why are we serving meat and uh, you know i come up with all the classic bullshit excuses uh cows aren't going extinct chickens aren't going extinct they're here for our consumption we've bred them uh and then it, it planted the seed hey it planted the seed and i knew that um i was i was talking shit to myself um and that i had to live with the answers that i was feeding others uh and i know convincing enough to you know, keep serving meat and vegan options at these music festivals. And then, uh, but it got me thinking, hey, and then uh, more and more you're going out protecting animals each day, risking your life to do it actually, uh, in the bush, carrying weapons uh, ready to come up against armed poachers and, and you know, rangers that are putting their lives on the line, willing to die to protect one group of animals and then coming home in an evening and literally throwing another group on a fire. Uh, and I'm, I'm not just saying that, I mean, on the fire, like open fire, roasting. And uh, and then um, I was asked to do this TEDx talk uh, at the Sydney Opera House on, um, on anti-poaching. And I hadn't done a lot of public speaking at that stage. And so I, so I started, uh, I was given six months notice uh, to prepare. So there's a lot of research that was going into that and just, Fell down the rabbit hole on that. Hey, uh, initially with uh, the movie Earthlings, uh, um, uh, one of your fellow fellow countrymen there, Gary Rofsky, uh, watching his talk, um, and uh, and then um, and then Philip Wallen, uh, who's a, a fantastic mentor and and someone that I look up to greatly, uh, and it's been a great inspiration in my life. And just you know, there's there's only so much bullshit you can feed yourself, and uh, before you just have to own up and, and, and take control of the truth. And uh, I suppose you know, for the vegans that are out there listening today, uh, they get frustrated by feeling as though they're speaking to a brick wall all the time when we're trying to get our message out. It's just, you know, my only advice is just keep having those conversations because they do add up. Uh, the truth is accumulative. Uh, it took me uh, quite some years, hey, but, but a conversation that someone had with me years earlier for them, it felt like it was falling on deaf ears, but it was a, a slight. It was it was the first crack in the veneer, you know. And over time, that crack opened up, and, and once the shutters lift, they never come down again. How hard is it being vegan in uh, Zimbabwe, or easy? Ah, it's cool, man. I mean, I'm sitting here in the office, which is outdoors, uh, undercover, obviously, and I can see they've got the veggie garden going on down there. Got another veggie patch over there. We've got lots of fruit trees. Uh, we've got about. I think seven acres of gardens up on our project now. Uh, we've got gardeners working around the clock. Uh, we, we we don't have uh, we don't have the supermarkets full of all the different vegan options. You know the different you know, fake meats and fake cheeses and all that sort of stuff. 
so everything we cook is is often uh, from a whole food, plant based approach, uh, which I love. But also, I love coming to America and just eating greasy cheeseburgers and vegan cheeseburgers yeah. and having yeah. all that stuff just <laughs> dripping down, dripping down my my wrists. They're like, yeah, um, eating like a savage. Yeah. Oh mate, yeah, eating all the bad stuff, all the like all the vegan junk food stuff. I love it because I don't get to have it too often. So, uh, but yeah, we 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 good here. Uh, all our program is vegan. All our ranges here. All the women are vegan. Uh, you've essentially got uh, a group of women doing one of the toughest jobs on the planet in one of the most remote and harshest locations. Uh, they're doing it all on a plant based diet, and they're kicking ass. Do you think, I mean, you're, uh, you know, an unlikely vegan for people who haven't seen you. You're, you're a big guy, you know, uh, you have a military record, you're a sniper, this overall badass. Do you think you get more, how do I say, it, like more attention because maybe you're an unlikely advocate for this cause? So it holds more water and attracts more people to the message rather than maybe a typical, stereotypical, what you, what people think of as vegan, maybe some skinny guy just out of college but when you say it it just it hold more water well look we, we've all got uh we've all got our own special approaches or backgrounds or skills that can appeal to different audiences and i don't think my message is is suited to everybody uh or, or the way that I, I can get it across but you know there's a certain group out of there out there that may be harder for the average vegan community to reach and I, and I think I can speak to that community because I come from I come from that side I'm an alpha male and being able to sit down with other alpha males and say well, you know why, why would we want to exploit something that can't protect itself our job in society uh, is to stand up and defend those that can't defend themselves and, and animals in our community should sit at the top of that list or at least at least very close uh, in terms of vulnerability and uh, you know so it, for me it's um, it's just a, a you, you got to play you got to play the hand you dealt this is the hand I've been dealt and I use it to every available um, opportunity I can uh, or advantage that I can to to help drive our message. So let's uh you know let's talk a little bit about about the animals that, that you guys are are saving or trying to save and uh, about the, the poachers and the poaching. Initially, I'm assuming you know when when you got there, uh, you probably looked at the, at the poachers with 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 hate and 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 disgust. Is that something that changed over time? Do you maybe have a little bit more sympathy now, or do you see them in a different light, or is it still the same and and it's it's a go? Oh, look, the, I, I'll tell you one thing. I don't enjoy, uh, and neither do, do any of our rangers, we don't enjoy arresting people. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing fun about watching someone uh, get locked up and put away for nine years. Uh, there's nothing fun about watching someone who's going out uh, trying to poach an animal to come back and feed their family. Uh, we do a lot of community work uh, from schools to clinics to roads, uh, education programs, 62 cents from every operational dollar we spend is going back into the community, 80% of that at household level into the hands of women. We're doing as much as we can with the budgets that we have to try and uplift these communities, provide alternate jobs. Bearing in mind we're a conservation organization and, and uh, we also get, get left with the social responsibility side of, of, of uplifting communities that, that you know, don't get much help from from other places, so uh, we we have to wear carry that burden on our shoulder. But also the 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 other thing we've got to look at is we, we need, you know, these are the tough decisions we have to make in life. We we now on a planet heading towards eight billion people. We've got a shrinking uh, shrinking natural world. Uh, I don't know if anyone's read E. O. Wilson's uh, book Half Earth. Uh, his Pulitzer Prize winning book, which he says you know, we need, need to set aside half of the planet. For nature, for us to stop our acceleration into the sixth mass great extinction, we're currently sitting at seventeen percent of the, the Earth's surface that's been set aside. So while it's it, it it's upsetting to see someone go away in prison for nine years for shooting an elephant, and knowing they're going to be away from their family, uh, what's more upsetting is the thought that if we don't draw a line in the sand and hold on to what we have left, then we're going to take everything with us. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, seeing those images of of an elephant or a rhino's half his face just chainsawed off and you know the the baby elephant just standing next to the mother i know mean, those images are, are are heartbreaking and then on top of that the fact that we know that 
the majority of of animals and and rhinos have gone i mean they're on the verge of extinction uh, you know everywhere across the planet um and then yeah. just to be sitting as some sort of a stupid trinket on someone's table yeah yeah it's uh it's infuriating it is hey and it's um you know all the, all the education in the world uh, you, i mean you might educate the consumer market to stop using one one animal product or or one type of horn and then before you know it they've moved on to something else next thing it's donkey skins or it's i mean there's a guy that just got caught with two suitcase cases full of uh zebra penises what i can just go i mean you know it's like what, what what's going on here yeah uh, well <laughs> uh <laughs> so yeah we human beings but where's are strange, all that going though all, that also, the, that, the that zebra penises, the tiger penises. That's where's the market for all these animals? That was going um, to China. Huh? That was going to China. Oh, China. And uh, it's not all China, but it's it's a huge part of it. And uh, as much as we like to hear that China's making all these efforts and bringing all these new rules and all these new laws, uh, we're on our knees as a global community right now because of uh, because of what happened in those wet markets in in uh, in Wuhan and. Uh, that that is a message from nature that we cannot go on treating her like shit and expect nothing back in return. And, and it, it, it may also made me realise that rangers, um, they're not just the first and last line of resort uh, of defence for for nature, but also uh, for humankind. Uh, we talk about shutting down wet markets. Our job is to stop animals from reaching places like that in the first in the first instance. So I've seen a few people, um, and I think there's someone, I can't remember the name, but he's got a huge reserve in South Africa. And what he does is uh, cut off rhino horns in conservation efforts. How do you feel about yeah. that? John Hume. Um, yeah, look, I, I, honestly, I don't know the answer uh, to the fate of the rhino. I think as a global community, we need to be setting aside more areas for nature and protecting them better. Uh, through our collaborations with surrounding indigenous communities. Uh, and for us, it's not just about any one particular species anymore. It used to be elephant, rhino. These animals are being targeted the hardest. Let's go out and defend them. Uh, now it's about protecting these wide open ecosystems uh, that form eco regions uh, and all the biodiversity that is contained within them. And uh, yeah, look, I. I um, I don't know the, the solutions to uh, to a rhino poaching or a trade in rhino horn. I, I, I think uh, a rhino's horn belongs on its snout. I've, I've, I've had different thoughts in the past. Uh, uh, looking at um, looking at different models on how rhino horn might be traded, and, and now I'm, I'm 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 firmly against it. I think uh, it's. Um, you know, I mean, why should we have to cut off a piece of an animal just so it can survive? Uh, why can't we just understand that uh, protecting nature is the right thing for all of us to do? Uh, I mean, if, if ever there's been a time in history uh, to be uh, learning that lesson, it is it is now. While we're locked up in our homes, unable to travel, uh, facing a global economic depression, uh, looking at a seven to nine trillion dollar international um, debt at the end of all this. I mean, come on, if we'd invested a fraction of that in just protecting nature in the first place, we wouldn't be having this conversation. I mean, yeah, if, if you mentioned COVID, what is the situation like in, in Zimbabwe right now? Is it uh, is the country on lockdown or is it uh, starting to open up? Things have started to open up the last week or so, and I, I don't know why uh, COVID seemed to have skipped over Zimbabwe and uh, we haven't been hit hard uh, here. Uh, at least by the virus, uh, the, the economic fallout for a, a community or, or a, a country where uh, a large percentage of the population lives hand to mouth each day, unable to go out and be able to generate that income uh, and get that food. It's, I mean, it's the country is um, is suffering, and uh, you know, I think the sooner we can get back to to, to business here. Uh, the better for a lot of people, and I, I, I do think a lot of people hold the same similar sentiments. Maybe, maybe um, the lockdown is is worse than the virus itself. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm assuming the two most uh, poached or hunted 
animals are, are the elephants and the rhinos. And I don't know those, those are the ones that you try to conserve the most. Um, as far as, I mean, I guess, how important are they to those ecosystems? I think people think that, oh, if they go extinct, it's just sad, but it's not just sad. There is a role that they play in that ecosystem. And if they go, they get wiped out. There's a whole cascade of other animals and plants and all these other things that go with them. And I think people don't understand that for elephants. I think people don't understand that for bears and for whales and sharks in the ocean. These ecosystems depend on these top guys at the top of the food chain, correct? Well, yeah, they, they, they do. And, and it's, a, it's like a rich equation. Uh, and when you start pulling pieces out of that equation, it, things don't add up. Uh, and elephants and rhinos are uh, the big the big herbivore gardeners of of Africa, uh, the way they clear out certain uh, uh, vegetation, the way they disperse seeds, uh, but also also the tourism dollar that they 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 generate. You know, a lot of people come over here to see wildlife, and I think a majority of of uh, the people that, that 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 come to Africa for tourism want to see animals and. Elephants and rhinos are right up on in in, in the list of, of animals that people want to see. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you start if you, if you don't have those animals, you start to lose the tourism income, and then when you lose the tourism income situation we're in at the moment, you can't pay rangers. So many rangers are employed through tourism companies or, or reserves, and uh, yeah, and then you just I mean the effect is cascading. You know, I've seen this. <sighs> I mean, I guess I could say it's idiotic. Yes, I would say uh, this idiotic argument from hunters and trophy hunters that they're actually conservationists. They're going and um, by hunting animals, they're conserving animals. And I never understood the reasoning behind it. But basically what they're saying is we're paying those communities and through that we're helping those communities. But if they really cared about those communities, if they really cared about animals, they would come as photographers, they would come as tourists, and they wouldn't. And a lot of it is also through canned hunting, right? They'll have these like areas yeah. where they just breed animals so hunters can come and shoot them. So the whole thing's it's it's pretty messed up. It's and it's not it's not genuine that they do care about them that they they are conservationists. Look, it's not. I wish it was just uh, that cut and dry, but it, it's not. Uh, many areas that are used for hunting, uh, trophy hunting, uh, you would never get people into them for photographic tourism, or not in a volume that would generate the same amount of income that that hunting does. I don't like hunting. Okay, let's let's just get that on the record. Uh, I don't like it that hunting for the operator here that runs these areas. It's not. It's not like they wake up in the morning and say, oh, "I want to go out and kill something." The operator, the person that has managed these areas in, in many cases for decades, uh, they, they don't see hunting as a pastime. It's an income stream. It's an income stream for them to be able to continue looking after an area. The guy that gets on the plane and flies over and wants to shoot the animal, that's that's the guy. That's they're the ones that sort of. You know, it's hard to figure out what, what's going through their head. The same thing that went through my head when I was a teenager, desperate for some form of respect, uh, taking aim at the vulnerable. Uh, look, uh, in some cases, hunting has worked as an economic model uh, for some areas uh, for decades, and in other areas, it's failed. And all the areas that we now manage are former trophy hunting areas. I own a trophy hunting company. We bought one out. Uh, it's never going to be used for hunting again. But with buying out that hunting company, we got the land. Uh, so, uh, and, and hunting is failing across much of Africa as an industry. Um, reduced wildlife populations, shifting policy and regulations around the export and import of, of, of certain trophies. Uh, and, and finally, a, a younger generation raised on social media and activism that just doesn't want to get, get on a plane and fly across the world to shoot something anymore. But uh, if I can say one thing about hunting, it's a uh, don't be upset with hunting. Be upset with the fact that as an international community, as a global community, we haven't come up with a different economic model to support so much wilderness that's out there that still relies on hunting to generate any dollar. Uh, let's not talk about how many dollars. Let's just say, I mean, these areas don't have a plan B. So if we want to jump up and down and say hunting's fucked, hunting shit, we need to stop it, that's fine. I'm all for it. You've got to come with a plan B. 
Yeah, I, I think it's it's split. I think there are people here that go out and they'll shoot a deer and that's food for the next three to five months, you know. Yeah. And then there are people that will pay fifty thousand dollars to go to Africa yeah. and essentially shoot a giraffe or shoot a lion or shoot a, all these yeah. majestic animals that are on the in uh, elephant Horrible. that are Horrible. on the verge of extinction. The the psychology behind that were I think there are two very different things. One is I need this to not that he need the, the people who shoot deer need that to survive nowadays. You can go to Whole Foods and buy food. Yeah. I'm just saying that's food for me and my family. Where the other one is, I just like to kill because whatever the Absolutely. reason that they have in their head. So yeah. those are, I think, are Absolutely. two different things. And and like you said, I think if we do find financial models, I'm assuming, you know, just because I, I want to think that people are better than that. I'm assuming that the, the all these places in Africa, in Asia, in across the world will just not offer that as as something that people can just come in and, and shoot any animal they want for the highest well, bidder. Well, the, the, a lot of this land is held under communal land trusts and uh, the, the traditional leaders and, and local councils, uh, uh, local government will lease these areas out to anyone that has a, a commercial idea. Uh, and the areas that we've all taken over, uh, the leases of, uh, all former trophy hunting areas. Historically, when we would form an anti-poaching unit, we would recruit men from around the country and bring them in. And they would form a unit that would go out and protect an area. And uh, the reason we, we recruited from abroad is because we wanted to avoid corruption. Uh, corruption is a big problem in Zimbabwe, and we didn't want people colluding with communities that they grew up in, with. It was a mistake, but it was you know we had to we had to try and make the, the best decision in, in a tough uh, situation. Um, now, with the women, uh, one of the, the main things we've noticed, as I mentioned before, is we haven't had a single incidence of corruption. Okay, So what that means is we can employ 100% uh, from the local community. Uh, and what it does is it turns the largest line item in our budget, which is salaries for rangers, it turns that from something that was being dispersed around the country into something that is now being invested directly into the local community, uh, mostly at household level. Uh, on paper, we're putting the same amount into that community every 34 days as what trophy hunting was able to do per annum. And then the bottom line triple gears because women spend 80 to 90% of their salary on family and local community versus a male that spends 30 to 40%. So we, we actually have a viable economic alternative to trophy hunting, which for us is only working with women at the center of the strategy. That's awesome, man. Well, I, I know you got to go soon, so I'll just uh, my, I'll have like a couple of last questions. Um, you know, try to keep things and, and end things on a optimistic note. Um, cool, man. Yeah. As far as your last, uh, I don't know how many, but how many years have you been there? In the last 10 years or so, what have you seen that kind of makes you hopeful for the future, makes you optimistic about conservation, about rhinos and elephants? Uh, look, just some recent data that we've gotten back uh, from um, – the uh, the work that we've been doing in, in what was the pilot area uh, for this program, Akashinga, uh, the first reserve in the world to be protected by women uh, only. Uh, we've we've the data back says that since we started there, there's been a 399 percent increase in wildlife populations. Uh, so I mean that's and that's in less than three years. And the fact that we've been given responsibility of so much more area now, it's it's inspiring. Uh, it uh, for us to keep going out and working harder. It's a tough time uh, for philanthropic giving around the world at the moment, uh, given the COVID uh, crisis. Um, donations is often one of the first things that people will cut off. Uh, and in, in, in a way, uh, wildlife is, is sort of being stung with a, a, a case of double jeopardy on, on the coattails of misery of, of ending up in these wet markets. They're now being hit again uh, through, through a downturn in tourism and downturn in, in funding. But Seeing the way that our rangers uh, have stepped up and uh, our special investigations work and, and the, the results are achieving, you know, rangers inspire me every day. They make me want to get out of bed and go out and do a better job at what I do uh, in leading this organisation. They, they, while we sit here now, they are out there on the front lines uh, risking their own life to hold on to the natural world and if that doesn't inspire, nothing will. When is Akashinga actually being released? I saw the trailer. It looks amazing. Uh, I think it, well, it's actually got into the AFI Film Festival. 
Um, so I'm doing a uh, an interview uh, uh, around that. I think in a week or so on the twentieth. Uh, so me and me and James Cameron will be uh, online uh, doing that talk, and uh, they'll be doing a screening there. Uh, of course, all these festivals are virtual at the moment. I think to the general public, it will go out later in the year in November. I can't wait. Well, I guess last thing is, I mean, you owe me a story. Okay, so. Uh, and I only because you said you're in the Israeli army. So there's there's, there's, yeah. a, there's, there's a mate of mine. So I've been to you've been to Colombia, yeah. You said you did some time in South. No, America. I've been to so so I did South I'm, America, but I I stopped at Peru. Peru is like my last country coming from the south. So my my buddy, so he's he's doing the same trip as me through South America, which involved uh, going across Colombia and across that top part towards Venezuela. Uh, it's quite dodgy. So he's he's traveling with an, an Israeli mate. And they, the bus that they're on gets stopped by the FARC rebels there in a roadblock. And the guy gets on, he says, is there any Israelis on the bus? And my mate, who's an English guy, sort of shuffles over. He's like, I'm not sitting too close to, to his <laughs> mate now. And, and, and you know, so the situa- situation started escalating. Uh, this guy didn't put his hand up and say he's an Israeli. Uh, and they've got you know, weapons up on everyone. They say, all right, passport's out. And this guy, this Israeli guy, didn't pull his passport out. Uh, I was actually in the, the luggage compartment under the bus. So they get this guy out uh, on the side of the road there and he pulls an Israeli passport out of his um, uh, out of his backpack and everyone on the bus thinks, shit, this guy's about to get executed. And uh, the leader of the FARC rebel group uh, for that region walks up to him uh, while he's at gunpoint on his knees on the side of the road. He hands him an Uzi and says, can you fix this? <laughs> 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 Obviously, the the, 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 Israeli army, the Israeli army issued weapon, and uh, I mean the guy. Apparently, the guy fixed it in like two seconds and handed it back to him. And he's like, <laughs> <laughs> "That's hilarious." Well, that that must be a very old story because I, I I don't think we have Uzis anymore. But that, yeah. that's so funny, man. He probably thought like, "Okay, this is you know." He was probably thinking about his family. This is the I'm not going to yeah. see them again. Yeah, fix it, Susie. Oh, that's hilarious, man. <laughs> that was a, that's a good story. I wasn't expecting that. Well, um, Damien, man, I really enjoyed our time. Uh, I know you have to go, so I don't want to keep you too long. But um, yeah, man, you're doing amazing work. I hope people now with with COVID start COVID starting to um, be not as bad, I guess, as it was a few months ago. People will start donating to these organizations that need it across the world, like yours, like Jill's, and many others. And um, yeah, where, where can people find you on uh, on social media? As they can follow, they can hear the story and follow the journey. Yeah, for sure. Hey, uh, International Anti Poaching Foundation, the IAPF.org, or if you just type in anti poaching, uh, we'll come up there. And uh, yeah, look, any support, even just learning more about the situation, what we do, it's, it's greatly appreciated. And uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for having me on today, brother. Really appreciate it and what you do and, and what you stand for. So thank you. Yeah, man, my pleasure. And I'll, I'll put all the all the uh, information in the show notes so you can guys can easily find it. And again, man, thanks a lot. Cool. Hey, thank Bye. you very much, everyone. Stay safe, man. Bye-bye.